everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Lee Perry and I'm the senior aide to Commissioner Wilson. Woo! <laughs> um, I am so grateful for the opportunity to have you here. And um, I would love to get started with interviewing Commissioner about last week's BCC meeting. This was a very exciting week and I want to start out by saying thank you to my dream team. I have Ann Ballmer and Lee Perry, two of the most brilliant minds in this area or all over the world in my opinion. And um, I know that right now we have been running 300 miles per hour and covering a lot of ground. And I know once we settle in, we are really going to do some pretty big and, and great things. And I just feel really honored to have these type of uh, team members. Mm -hmm. So the BCC meeting this week was my first. I was literally more nervous about it than I was on my swearing in Aww. day because there is so much information and there are so many ongoing cases and, um, and issues and I'm very fearful of letting things fall through. So I want to start out our conversation about this by saying mm -hmm. if you know something that may be coming up, don't assume that your commissioner knows about it. And when I say mm -hmm. that, I mean that in the kindest way towards staff. They do a great job of briefing us and trying to get information, but mm -hmm. there is just a lot of information. And sometimes something that is critical to somebody out there may not have made it onto the radar of the right people in here. So that part of mm -hmm. um, sort of uncovering all those details is really important. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, um, it was considered a shorter, shorter meeting because some of them, I guess, go into the evening. Mm -hmm. And this one was, uh, you know, just most of the regular business day. We started right at nine and it, I think, got out right before five. Yeah. So it was, it was manageable. Well, maybe you can tell us a little bit about why these BCC, what it means, why they happen, how frequently they happen, and maybe give people an overview of what is an agenda. Okay, so the Board of County Commissioners meets once every two weeks to do its regular business. Commissioners and the mayor can't get together just willy-nilly to talk about issues that will be voted on because they need a public record. It has to be agended, there has to be minutes, and it has to be accessible to all of us, to everyone, you, me, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so those are calendared in advance, um, and the way that they actually formulate an agenda is there are many working parts but they have things at, at the very beginning of the day that are consent, considered consent agenda items and what that means is that it's sort of served up if you will as a tray for a vote um, oftentimes those are things that have either already been through a very long process and have made it to the consent agenda or they're more ministerial things like a regular appointment that has is, is re-upping um, so when I say ministerial, what I mean is there, there's not a lot of discretion in whatever the action is. It may be a re-upping of something that needs to be renewed. Um, and then the, in the afternoon, um, it actually becomes a quasi-judicial meeting, which what that means is that there are um, decisions that are made by the board on items that are considered hearing items. Um, oftentimes, they're uh, in regards to either a zoning variance or, or some plans that were made in a development. But that can also include um, uh, various other action items that may be needing a discussion amongst the commissioners, um, and that's the place to do that. So even though we as a public, and, and I say this because that was where I met many of you all, was giving public comment right here in this building, that we give our public comment before strangely a part of the meeting that isn't really an open discussion part of the meeting and i think it's a little bit awkward i don't love that setup because i think you give your public comment and it takes all of your energy to really get that information out and you would really love to hear something back in in the form of a discussion amongst the leaders uh, in your county and that's just not the setup of that first part of the agenda so you know if you come here uh, for the first time and give public comment and then you see that the consent agenda on unrelated issues being voted on. It's just the way that formula um, is set. Mm -hmm. um, it does allow, the good news is it does allow more time in the afternoon, which is why sometimes it turns into an evening mm -hmm. for discussion items if they are something that needs to be discussed at length or is something that there are um, sort of a deeper dive factually mm -hmm. that, needs to, that need to come out. 
Yeah, that's one thing that I really appreciate now is that from the outside, it feels like it's such a slow process. But the fact that now I'm learning about the actual re reasons behind the procedural like process, it makes me feel more confident in the system, you know? Yes, and not to say that we don't need to address some of the, the gaps and some of the places where I think we're not hearing what residents and constituents actually want, because they are, but it should give you some confidence. I think one of the things that, um, that we've been working on this week that I think it would be really important for everyone to know about is um, in Orange County, we have over 30 advisory boards. We have over, was it 400, I think, um, mm -hmm. positions, volunteer positions that citizens step into the role of doing that help advise in, in decision making on a more micro level. And then those positions go to the commission as, um, as items that, that have been either opined or even voted on by those advisory boards. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you are somebody who really wants to be involved, but you don't want to run for office, you don't want to give up your, your job, but you really want to see those operations, I would really encourage you to go on to the Orange County website mm -hmm. and fill out an application, look at the different boards, see if there's something that in your skill set or interest or your, um, something that you would like to contribute as far as what we do as a community. There are so many different things um, that are, you know, really require citizen input. And before I ran for office, I was on the Children and Family Services Advisory Board. And it, it was a delight. It was actually really a, a um, loved the board that I worked with, um, loved the people at Great Oaks Village where we take um, care of some really amazing kids. And so it gave me a very different glimpse into the workings of just one small avenue of what happens in our community. So um, go on the Orange County website and please take a look at those boards. Consider filling out an application. Even if there aren't openings for something that look like something you would want to do or be interested in, they can hold on to those applications for a period of time. Um, and then just reach out to us and let us know that it is something you're interested in so that I can um, make the person who that you know pulls those applications when there's an opening or there's an appointment due uh, I can give them a heads up. So that, that would work really well. And that way I know that the people who are interested in the same things we're interested in and still you know, really want to contribute to our community for the better good are plugging in everywhere they can. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to hear that there's so many different ways that people can make their voices heard. Um, maybe before we get into like your process of, of electing different people onto different boards, we can talk a little bit about what an agenda is and what it looks like. Yes, okay, so let me hold, I'm, I'm gonna hand my mic over for mm -hmm. one second because I just wanna show you all. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so these get delivered to the offices with the items that we go over on a Tuesday. Um, I pulled just the actual index so that, because I think it's a good way to kind of get an idea for the for what the day looks like. Um, so I know I just mentioned that there's a consent agenda, which is exactly how it starts. And then the index breaks out um, which parts come next. And you can see I tabbed, <laughs> I tabbed things either coded for um, a color that I, you know, was like a yellow was my caution, go back and do some research, red was my stop, this isn't something that, um, and then I, I tried to do blue for, you know, I like this, I want to make sure that I am sharing or I am, um, it's like more my internal approval of something. So, so I did color code that and I'm geeky enough to continue my color coding. Um, even when we go digital, cause I wanna talk about that. Um, we have the option here and this office is really committed to uh, decreasing our footprint, it, you know, in an administration like this where there's so much going on, I know there it's difficult to do, but one of the things we have the option to do is to actually get our agendas digitally. So starting, I believe, in the next meeting cycle, if we get the training for how to use the, um, the software, I legislate. the iLegislate, we're gonna be able to do this digitally and just think about how free our arms are gonna feel. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, in, in doing it digitally, from what I understand, we'll still be able to interact um, staff 
we'll be able to interact and um, talk to each other about agenda items. So it won't, we won't lose the capability of having a binder that we can tab. We will just be tabbing it digitally. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the agenda, um, like I said, it starts with the consent agenda, which is a lot of times sort of the more boring stuff because there are things on there like approvals for continuations of contracts for everything from who cuts the grass outside the building here to who provides um, parking tickets <laughs> <laughs> and all, all everything in between. So um, those contracts were all approved in a process that includes elected officials. So that, that is a sort of a checks and balances for making sure that those contracts are done with transparency. Um, within the agenda, something that we went over this week that I think if you tuned in might have been confusing was a petition to vacate. You know, it's a, it, it has a, a sound to it that sounds like, um, uh, you know, that you're abandoning something or that somebody is giving up on something. If, you know, as a layman, I would wonder what, what, is, what does that mean? And um, so I wanted to sort of explain it a little bit in that when the county requires the use of any portion of land, either for a right of way or uh, a sidewalk easement, utility easement, those things are put into plans really, 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 really far in advance. Well, sometimes later in the history of the area, the use for that changes or isn't needed anymore. And the person who owns the property that that little piece that the county took or used or borrowed um, wants it back. Mm -hmm. So the petition to vacate is the ask, can I have that piece of property back? You didn't put the sidewalk there. You didn't put the power lines there. Can I have that piece of property back? So um, within the meeting on Tuesday, there were several uh, agenda items that they came up and they were immediately voted on yes. And I just want to assure everybody it wasn't because we didn't analyze those because I did look at every single one of the petitions to vacate just to make sure I understood what they were doing and where it was. Um, but that those are really freeing up a piece of someone's land mm -hmm. to be used for whatever it's supposed to have been used for that we were holding on to as a government. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the agenda items this week, of course, included things that I'm hoping in 2021 they quit including, which includes the COVID-19 update. And I, I just want to compliment staff who have, there are people in this government that had no background in how to handle a global pandemic. I don't think even people in health services, unless, you know, government operations really knew how to handle something that was this intensive and, and that would go on this long. And we got the update for what, um, what county was doing for people, including the distribution of the remaining CARES Act funding. Hopefully, hopefully the federal government will get it together and re-up funding for the CARES Act. We are not out of the woods yet, N not by health standards or by economic standards. I feel like there is hope on the horizon, but we have to stay safe, which may mean trimming, you know, continually trimming how many people are allowed into businesses and how businesses operate. And if we are asking businesses to do that, then we should be able to provide them with some relief. If we are asking people to work and school from home, we should be able to figure out how to make sure they can stay in their home. So those things were a partnership with the county, the county partnered with the Federal CARES Act, and we utilized every last penny. So those have gone directly to our residents, to our local businesses, and you know, with any, you know, hopefully, because I think there's been general agreement that there needs to be some, some more relief before mm -hmm. we come um, around the corner with vaccinations and getting things back to where they were. Mm -hmm. There was also an update from emergency uh, management. They do um, the testing sites, the PPE um, uh, delivery to businesses and uh, availability to um, citizens who may need them. And so they, what they updated was basically the shoring up and gearing up for whatever this vaccination process is going to look like and i think without getting too in the weeds and you know anybody that wants to hear the really the, the fine details on this please go up go to the website and take a look because it really was it was very interesting but to get um the kind of the most important points it's going to be a process and just like every part of this since march 
we're going to have to be really patient and really um, careful to continue to protect the most vulnerable people. There's, I think, a tendency to get this fatigue and we are, we just really want to be around each other right now. It's the holidays. I, I, everybody has that, that tug. We're so close. Don't sacrifice somebody you love now who you may be able to spend more time with in the future. If, you know, we're looking at, we're in the tail end of this. We are, I mean, and I mean that in the way that protect them this Christmas so we can be with them next Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I and I hope by next Christmas that that's the case. It looks like there are gonna be layers of this coming out. And we start, of course, with our healthcare providers because once they're safe, then we know that our sickest people can be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So, that's And I know that um, our other aide, Ann Vollmer, is putting together like resources from within the county and outside of the county. And we hope to have a landing page with some of those resources by our next meeting and then dive a little bit deeper into those on December 30th so yes yes stay tuned for that we're gonna make sure that any of those um, anything like that as far as being able to link with um, either nonprofits or with government services or with inf information sometimes just facts are really good that we have that provided for you um, through as many ways we can get that out to you because I think in that's going to continue to be important as far as being able to know where and when and how things are coming down the pipeline. Well, let's take a look at this oh, big yeah. fat binder yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so how it's often <laughs> do these get delivered and what's, what's the substance of okay. these? So I kind of, you know, poked through this a little bit, right? Um, the public hearings, if you look at the agenda are in the afternoon and, and a lot of them are with, planning and development and zoning, and these are issues that are near and dear to the constituents and the residents of District 1. The planning and, um, and development process is complex, but it's not a mystery. We have advisory boards, mm -hmm. we have staff. They actually provide a packet of information to us as a commission. I spent a lot of time speaking to them this week and I was really grateful to them for taking the time to go over the issues with us. Um, so when we think about zoning variations, which were some of the agenda items in here, um, I for one feel very much like, well, zoning is put into place for a reason. We wanna make sure that we are able to, um, you know, use sidewalks where they're supposed to be used and the school zones are, are low speed zones and that's why we zone the way we do. But sometimes when there's a variance and this was the case in this past agenda, it's because there's something that, that makes sense for somebody that isn't in our plan. So th in particular, there was a, um, a resident in our district that needed or wanted to put a generator on the side of his house that had a particular setback based on our zoning uh, code. And so the variance asked to be allowed to put that generator out there. Um, it is also in an area that loses power in storms and it's a safe, uh, uh, high efficiency outside generator. So really it's a much safer thing for that family not to be operating a gas generator from their driveway or you know, most dangerously closer to the inside of your garage. So um, that seemed like a very obvious yes vote. So if you heard some of those votes, mm -hmm. um, there are items in um, the, oh, ooh, sorry about yep. that. Oh my goodness. Not sure what that noise was, we've been, We've been moving furniture and art around a little bit, so we are, <laughs> if you heard some bumps from the other room, it's mm -hmm. because um, maybe the furniture is moving itself now. <laughs> We're not sure. Find out. Little, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, where was I? Yeah, you were just talking about public hearings. Okay, so, um, so the public hearings. So any of these decisions that are made are gonna first be talked about in the boards that give advice or give input or approval to the commission. So my, my hope is that as we continue to dialogue about this and as we continue to try to get the information out about sort of the how, how you can get involved about these decisions is to even back up from before we are at the BCC to where we're talking about some of these decisions either in the planning of um, a comp plan amendment, which is where we change something in our overall plan, or in one of the um, zoning, 
um, um, committee um, advisory boards. So, so if there's something that comes up in one of those that looks like it's of interest, I'm gonna make sure I try to relay it as quickly as I can to our community. Mm -hmm. If there's something that you know about that you can relay this way, then we can engage and make sure that we're getting as much information going back and forth as possible. I, I will say that it, it's been, you know, this is an ongoing process. There was no pause button for a, a, a transition of leadership in any level. Mm -hmm. So there are things that unfortunately, you know, so much of the groundwork has happened before I got here that when I, when I am in there looking at it, I can be either a one no, which is how that happens sometimes, or I can try to get more information or, but there are things that um, will be coming that we'll be able to see from now on when they, when they start, when they get to, um, the application actually gets to the government. So um, I just wanna kind of give a, a designation to those things that were already in process as being something that, you know, we can't put the toothpaste back in that tube, mm -hmm. but we can try to make sure that we learn from whatever those experiences are and apply that knowledge going forward. Yeah, and you know, people can email their concerns or comments to the district one at ocfl.net email address or put your comments in the Facebook Live right now and we'll try to take some questions at the end. Yes, I would love that. In fact, so th this top binder, and I'm not gonna bore you to death, well maybe I will, I don't know, stay with me, stay with us, um, <laughs> is actually a list and has all the information about all the different advisory boards. So this is, um, you know, just if you can see, there's just a sampling, but um, the commitment for most of them is, you know, an hour a month. Maybe it's an hour every two weeks. Uh, we do think it, attendance is important. So I would say don't jump into it unless it's something that really means something to you. But if it does mean something to you, go on the website, fill out the application, give us a shout out so we know it's coming in. We'd love to be able to um, to interact with you on what you find important in those advisory boards. Really, there's there's so there's so many, and and some of them are um, you know very utilitarian, and some of them are really you know great parts of our social service net. And so they're, they're all over. I would, I would love to get some feedback from people about that. And so I'm gonna put that one out of the way. Okay, lightening my load here. <laughs> um, the good news in our week long learning of what was coming up at the BCC and the presentations that we were able to get is that we were able to meet with our sustainability chief here in Orange County and get a uh, he, resiliency and, and um, sustainability, um, we were able to get a presentation of their plan. Um, and this is actually a, a part of the draft plan. And it was, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal, Jeff, if you're watching, I'm gonna steal your term. Um, it's really looking first at what's under the hood here in Orange County government as um, setting the stage and the, being the model for then what we're gonna take out into the community as far as the sustainability plan. And it is multi-pronged, and some of it is going to be easy, some of it's gonna be a heavier lift, but I am confident with the team we have here that it's gonna happen. Um, so there's uh, energy and climate action, buildings and infrastructure, water use and quality, mobility and fleet, supply chain materials um, and materials management, and my, my favorite, trees and land. So what that means is looking under the hood and trying to really incorporate some of these things right here in, um, in government operations. Orange County government has buildings all over the county. We need to make those more efficient. We need to make those more resilient. We need to make them, we need to decrease our carbon footprint. We need to set that example. So um, you know those are the first and immediate needs um, as far as the mobility and fleet, some of those things are, are, are more straightforward. It's about retiring our gas guzzling older fleet vehicles and trying to be innovative in the way that we're um, using fleet vehicles. And when I say fleet vehicles, whenever you have um, someone come out and check your water meter or do work on a power line, those are fleet vehicles. And so we need to really look at how we can retire some of the ones that have been poking <laughs> Um, big holes in our carbon uh, problems and, and replacing them without breaking the bank. Because I think we can figure out how to do that and still really be able to give a cost benefit to our, our residents. 
Um, and then, you know, as far as our, I think we could spend a whole one of these talking about water. You know, and I think it's something that, yes, we, we all feel very strongly about. And probably if you're somebody who followed my campaign, you know how strongly I feel about it. Coming away from this meeting, I'm feeling very encouraged that we can make some, some real inroads in, in the, in the um, endurance of our supply chain for our residents, but we need to make sure that, um, that we're taking that from under the hood and out into the community as quickly as we, as quickly as we can. I think um, as far as the trees and lands, there, there's a lot of opportunity that we are gonna need to be creative, but there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, Orange County owns quite a bit in, in terms of its you know, assets and property and making sure that we know where we can turn that those assets into something green for our people or where we can actually try to leverage a private partnership for green space for our, our, our residents. So, um, you know, it'll all be coming in the days and weeks of the future. 2021, I feel like, is going to be the dig in and get these done year. Um, what do you think, Lee? I would love to hear your take on his presentation also, and because I thought it was, you know, gave me great optimism. And I, I actually, let me say this. At first, I was actually shocked that we weren't already doing this because I, because <laughs> I kind of felt like Orange County is the leader in so many things as far as innovation, and we have such a great um, environmental community here that I was surprised. Mm -hmm. That being said, they've got the right people, they've got the right plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think. So knowing Jeff for a long time and then seeing him become the director of sustainability and resilience here at the county, um, I, I think at first I was a little afraid that the county was going to mostly solely focus on county buildings and getting them to be more energy efficient and getting, you know, uh, the water usage down, which is a great first step. But I felt like that step, just like you said, was a little bit further behind than what I had anticipated in this time of, you know, the climate crisis and, and the water crisis that we have, right? So um, at first when I saw Jeff get into his role, I was excited that hopefully he would expedite that, but I thought that would be kind of the limit of what he would work on the first year or two. And then when we were finally able to sit in on this briefing, I saw that it's a lot more comprehensive. In fact, I think these 17 goals, which we can share with you and drop it in the comments after the event. Um, it actually was from a study with several different um, scientists and consultants that came together and did over 200 and I think he said 40 goals, but they condensed it down for this first draft, this first phase draft that they're putting out into the public as like their first step. Um, and so they're not thinking just internally like they're thinking outward in the next 5 10 30 years i think i do too and i actually want to uh, piggyback on on that by saying that um the other i want to really really brag about this mm -hmm. i thought it was great that jeff's team what they did was they pulled in these people to do this instead of hiring an outside consultant which would have cost taxpayers mm -hmm. money i think it's still really important if they had done it that way but I think that what they did was then they, they allowed some of that money to stay in the coffers should it need to be used immediately mm -hmm. for something, for, you know, which we're going to need more and more of. So I, I thought that also being as cost conscious from the outset as far as studying mm -hmm. and, and getting the expertise and getting a, you know, a plan was really, really something outstanding. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a huge I'm a huge person when it comes to water and reforestation and conservation. Like some of these, oh, some of these major points here are like music to my ears. However, one of the biggest things that I heard was one of the most like impressive and um, what Jeff was saying was kind of one of the the biggest obstacles was the new um, material. Um, or they call it the MRF, but the material recycling um, plant that they have to basically help uh, reduce our landfill waste as much as possible. Um, I think there's a new contract going on right there, now. There was a proposal that came through procurement, so hopefully okay. this is going to be done. I mean, I think it's... Which is great because, you know, I think a lot of people want to see progressive changes in, in our recycling, um, which is one major step. Of course, lessening your consumption as well, but 
for the most part, to hear that the county has such ambitious goals, it's and, and like- And part of that was, and I'd like to hear this because in District 1, of course, we have our municipalities that are um, involved in some of them have been very upfront about the fact that they can't afford to do the recycling programs that they've committed themselves to. And, and so part of this plan was also partnering with those municipalities to mm -hmm. get them what they needed to make sure that, that countywide mm -hmm. that, that residents were recycling. Because right now it's single stream, which means everything's going into one, which is a really slow and, and I think inefficient way of, you know, in comparison to other countries that have really progressed in their uh, waste management. Um, but look at these, in these ambitious goals. Increase waste diversion rates to 70% by 2030 at county facilities and then externally from the county decrease the per customer landfill disposal tonnage by 15% by 2025. That's so it's soon. Yeah, it's very aggressive, which I think we, we were very, we were excited about. So I know, you know, no pressure, Jeff, but we're really excited. So, <laughs> and actually maybe we can do one of these and I know, I don't know if we're putting him on the spot right now, if he's watching. Oh, he would love to. He said he wants help getting the word out. So we'll drop this in the chat um, after this event and please share and write your comments and we would love some input. It, it seems to me that the challenge that he's going to have, because he's got a great team, he's got a great, he's got, the, you know, this fantastic plan and and I think he's got the public because, of course, I mean, you can tell by what happened this year, even in the elections, that it's on the minds of most residents. Mm -hmm. But I think it's getting threading this very thoroughly through all of the departments here so mm -hmm. that the culture changes mm -hmm. is it's going to be a challenge. So I do think it's going to take as many people as possible because I know I have friends that work in some of these divisions and mm -hmm. I have, you know, departments that don't necessarily always interact with us here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to take all of that yeah. to, uh, to make sure that, that this, get these goals are met. And I think it starts with this big binder right <laughs> here. <laughs> we get three of these <laughs> crazy. every two weeks in the office to, for review. And then basically they're just, I think the binders re repurposed, but it's moving over to electronic, right? Yes, we're so excited about that. Yeah. Very excited about it. And I think it's, it's, it's all those little things, because even though we're one office, if that becomes contagious, you mm -hmm. know, and this building ends up, you know, really going digital, which they have the capabilities. We have a great um, ISS department here. So the capability is there. Um, it's just going to be breaking that habit and making sure that we can get, mm -hmm. um, make it as easy for people as possible to see that, you know, look, we're doing it and <laughs> we're pretty clueless. So um, <laughs> we can do it. You can do it. Come do this with us. It's great because you have the advantage of learning the yes. electronic way right. instead of having decades and decades and decades of the binder right. way. Right, exactly. That's kind of like how people have just learned. Exactly. So I think it's going to be a, an advantage that we have that, um, yes, we still have the learning curve, but uh, we're learning fresh that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'll be excited to kind of report back on how that goes and mm -hmm. say, you know, this is a, you know, really exciting. We no longer have binders stacked up everywhere <laughs> in our office. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, especially since we're going to cover COVID on December 30th and some relief and things like that, um, before we get into that, I think talking about job creation and, and help for small businesses is something else that you kind of prioritize this week. Yes, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to speak with um, the UCF um, Institute for Economic Forecasting, um, their business incubation program. And they partner with other um, nonprofits that assist entrepreneurs in getting up and going. And really what their vision is and what they've put into place is providing the, you know, tools, resources, connections, contacts, whatever is needed to um, get entrepreneurs who have these great ideas but don't really know how to shore up the business model um, off the ground and, and, and successful. I think going forward, there are so many people that are s transitioning from having worked, you know, from a company with a company for a long period of time to trying their own business. And because there are needs that have popped up that are new and different, but those needs, uh, you know, they're great. Or, you know, you have this great business idea. What do I do with it now? So we really have some great resources for how to connect you if you have a business idea. There are... Um, I'm going to continue to make these connections so that we can come out to, um, I think, 
I think when you hear UCF Institute for Economic Forecasting and the UCF Business Incubation that you think it's on the east side of town or Lake Nona or downtown. And yes, that is where the physical offices are. But we are part of their program. We are part of their Orange County wide. So we can really have them participate and help any of the um, businesses in our district. Mm -hmm. So I really look forward to to seeing those connections made mm -hmm. in the you know coming months. And I think mm -hmm. you know I think we're going to be able to really also draw on some of these relationships mm -hmm. to try to bring those type of businesses to District One because District One has such great. Um, has so many things to offer a, a business that may be able to provide more of those high-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think too, even for businesses that are already established that just need to learn how to like optimize their model or maybe rent really cheap office space, right. I think they have a lot of resources like that. Um, and I know that if you like just have general questions, Right. they're also a good resource yes, too. Yes, yes, because I didn't really understand the model and they were very patient <laughs> with me in explaining what they did and I loved I loved hearing about their connections mm -hmm. with young entrepreneurs or people who are transitioning from another career mm -hmm. or another job. And so I think it, it, it provides um, another layer of support that we really wanna be able to, to bring to the district as far as um, some people who are transitioning from what was their job into something else in life? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I believe that we're going to be back in, you know, probably full swing it, at some point within our tenure, within this four years. But I also think that in the meantime, if, if you've learned something about the way that you want to do something like a business, that you should be able to find out how to structure that to be successful. Or if your business that you've had mm -hmm. just hasn't reached its potential, it seems like there's a lot out there that we can try to connect you with. So mm -hmm. I am excited about those um, opportunities. It makes me grateful to live somewhere that we've got UCF and we've mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. all of the, um, the businesses that then support those type of programs. That's actually one of the things that they said was that quickly, you know, given COVID, we understand that there's been some setbacks, but very quickly, Florida, Central Florida specifically, is becoming a hub of business and innovation and that companies are finding a particular interest to start and grow their businesses here. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite parts about that meeting was that they were basically referencing, before we even told them that we just met with Jeff earlier that day about <laughs> the sustainability plan, but they actually brought up their interest in 2021 through 2025, creating more sustainability focused job creation opportunities clean energy, job creation, uh, th all of it was just right in line with the way that we're envisioning the next four or five years. So it was, it was very exciting. And, um, and I think there's great opportunity. So I, yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited. Um, so maybe now we can take a little bit of time to answer some questions. Do we have any questions coming in? We have two questions so far. Okay. Okay. So it comes from Jessica Lee, and she's asking about Bird Island on Grace Butler. Mm. And she's like, you're thinking about doing a situation there. Uh, apparently, she lives on the lake, and it doesn't seem like anybody can live there at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like you have a friend who's kind of going down there. And also, just explain the context of why it's just happening. Okay, so this question comes from a resident that lives on the lake where Bird Island is located Lake Butler it's beautiful and I know I have heard you're not alone I've heard from constituents that live there that are very concerned with the integrity of the lake and what was put there as a protection we have talked about it internally um, and we have um, met with actually the person that um, helps place people in the boards and figuring out how that we can communicate with the board that oversees some of the decisions on the Butler chain um, I would like if you have an opportunity, if you will email me because um, I, I need to have some residents speak directly to some of the things that I would like to contact um, FWC about, Florida, Fish and, or, um, uh, Florida Wildlife Commission. Um, it is owned by Audubon and it's maintained by, uh, by 
Florida Wildlife Commission, but we as a county, um, I think can shore up some of the protections that were supposed to have been in place. So if you will contact me directly, I would love to speak to some of those. Um, I would like to have some a good factual record um, going to speak with the people at the state so that we can try to make sure that we're uh, adding the, per the correct protections without restricting people who really wanna actually utilize also the, the um, lakes in our area. This was the location that had a lot of like litter and yes. people kind of abusing the space. It's right? correct, and it was it was protected. It's a it, you know Bird Island is it's beautiful. It's a it's a undeveloped piece of property that has you know cypress and you know some of these you know, beautiful um, birds that are protected under law. But unfortunately, because it's its own. Um, easement really is what it is i mean it's owned by it's owned by audubon and it's supposedly protected by state um oversight we can for sure do some we can shore up some of those things so we'll have to take a um take a factual record in to fwc and find out what what the next steps are but i do think it's um it's important that I have as much of that from residents as possible as far as what they are. And I know you've, you've probably been to meetings in the past, so I apologize if this is a duplication. If you've already made a, um, a document that has some of those issues, please send them on over and we will, um, we will round back and make sure that we're getting in front of the right people. I think, I think there are a lot of opportunities, but it is, it's beautiful. Lee hasn't seen it. We, we need to take a field trip. Um, you know, Windermere is a very unique area because the area that, if you talk about water protection, that they didn't they didn't pave the older streets in Windermere so that when they're when they have rainfall, it's it's literally filtered through, and that you know they don't have that impermeable surface issue that we have all over the the county. And so the quality of the water has been really outstanding over time. But Bird Island, unfortunately, is shallow around the edges of it, so people do you know drop anchor and um, stay out there all day as though it were a free party space and you know uh, without proper enforcement there were there have been accidents out there there's litter and so you just know that the ecosystem has been has been damaged so we're gonna mm -hmm. yeah we'll it's on, it's on my list mm -hmm. and you can also email uh, district one at ocfl.net and we have a brand new system where we are taking all of these inquiries and making sure that everything is documented um, because that's basically the tools for the commissioner yeah. to use in the future. So please email any, any information that you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. He's got, oh, got very specific question. Okay, so this, so you basically were saying that how can the county, can you repeat that one more time? What can the county do more to prevent raw water resource nitrification? Uh, raw water resource nitrification, meaning like uh, waste man water management. I, it, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like poop in the water. Yeah. Nitrogen comes from poop. And making sure that people are not getting sick because we, we that's a surefire way to get sick is to be pooping mm -hmm. in our, our water. So, um, oh, I actually have one to add that I remember telling you about, if you don't mind, before you dive into that. Um, I know that the county is partnering with SELF, it's S E L F, and it means um, Solar Energy Loan Fund. And it's a nonprofit bank that helps to give really low percentage um, rates for loan and, and improvements for different types of energy efficiency, or let's say you need to remodel your home because you have a disability and you need you know, wheelchair accessibility in your home. Well, why that's significant to this is because they also cover septic tanks. Right. I was gonna say this is gonna, yeah, this, this is a septic tank issue. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I mean, we got runoff we have runoff issues also, and I think looking at some um, some of the impermeable areas that we may be able to try to figure out how to 
get more permeable is going to be a high priority. But the with the septic tank, it, it, because because right now there are it seems there are more financial opportunities available to assist residents. Mm -hmm. I think maybe what we'll do is is set up some kind of a um, our own internal track for helping connect those re residents to resources mm -hmm. um, to help them if they want to retrofit and get mm -hmm. their septics up to date because of course that leaching is you know it's a huge problem all over the state and you know those types of partnerships that the county and the city of Orlando and other cities are bringing to purposefully bring these resources like a low risk uh, loan that someone who otherwise probably didn't check their septic tank for over a decade. They're supposed to be checked every five years, but people put it off because it's expensive. It's expensive and I think people are concerned, yeah, they're concerned that something's gonna happen that will put them in a monthly bind because, you know, when you think about county utilities that, you know, and if you go on county services, that that will somehow, you know, put them in a hardship and I think what we have to do is make sure that it doesn't because if, if we're all paying for the mm -hmm. for the negative effects of old septic then it's more cost effective mm -hmm. to figure out how to get those things remediated and I think um, my my hope is that some of the grants that used to be mm -hmm. available with a change in administration at the top that we'll be able to see some um, some of those things come come through because I do think there's going to be more investment in um, in what we now know is a very important health issue, which is you know making sure that we're not poisoning our, our citizens and um, yeah. So I, and I like that you tied that back with um, keeping our frontline people healthy. It's it it is it's everything. If you if you don't have clean water, then you know it doesn't matter how great your vaccines are. And I think it's all it's all really important. So. Um, yeah, stay tuned. And you know what, Jay? I was gonna say we can get <laughs> we can get with you too because I know I know that you've been known to uh, jump in. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jay actually helped with the Split Oak uh, yes. campaign. And um, you know, also it's very closely tied to smart growth because in my little experience with hearing about planning and zoning, right now all of Florida is growing exponentially. And I think the accountability and just the full on just deeper look and and honestly obligation to put homes responsibly in areas where we can figure out where the septic or sewer water is going to go without because if it, if a community grows so quickly and you don't have the ability to handle all that capacity of water usage and wastewater management. That's right then okay so this actually it reminds me of something that I want to let people know about that I think is really important um, so Jay this is something that I would like for if you could get the word out to you know everybody that's on here if you can spread the word about this so one of the things that's going on right now is there's actually a review of the next comprehensive plan so some of the things that we see now as being you know really big problems could have been prevented had they had the comprehensive plan incorporated ideas to prevent them. The next comprehensive plan is in development right now and there are um, actual meetings that are going to that are taking place and there are public comment um, options even on the website. So if you can't go to the meeting, um, they are digital, I mean they're WebEx, so they should be available to everybody. But if if for some reason you can't, you are still able to give a public comment. Now that can be as detailed as it needs to be. So if if you are an expert or you know or you are an understanding of what's going on in our waterways and where we're seeing degradation because of some of these either leaching or runoff or whatever the issue, lay out what you believe to be the reason in a very thought out way. And once again, the more factual record we have, the easier it will be to implement those when that final plan is put into place. Um, so this, this one will literally be going to 2050 the next plan and so comprehensive plans you know were put into place in order to try to keep growth manageable in the state of Florida but at the state level they really stopped requiring counties to abide by them so it's back on us which is fine because I think we can do that if we 
if we do stick with the plans that protected people, and then we look at the things that didn't. I, I think when I look at what the rural overlays, you know, were supposed to have meant, and then how we boxed them in, I, I don't think that was the intent, and I don't know, you know, how we make sure that the people that are in those boxed in rural overlays are getting the services they should be getting without being deprived of the rural environment that they were promised. So it really ends up being sort of a double-edged sword for, for those people. And you know, I'm, I'm very aware of it because District 1 has several of them. So I know that going into the next comprehensive plan, if I can get people who live in those rural areas to make sure they're giving their public comment, we can incorporate all of that into our, what we see as a vision going to 2050. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy that they're written 50 years out, right? Yeah, but it, you know, it, they're written 50 years out. And then the problem is that of course they can be amended. And that's what a lot of times you see comprehensive plan amendments mm -hmm. that are coming before the board. And some of those are density issues. And you know, I know that density affects everybody in some form or another. And how we manage those densities is really where the rubber meets the road as far as quality of life issues, because it goes to how many cars are traveling in front of a place or what kind of transportation is needed there. It goes to what our school, what kind of schools need to be in that area. So that density conversation is really the most important. And I think when we look at, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We look at areas all over the world that have done it in a way that works for their residents that provide a high quality of life. It's because they've really thought about where they put those high density areas and then where they draw the line on urbanism and you know and then they don't they don't continue to chip away you know so that we continue to can get dense here and not there and and so when you know you see these areas on our map that are rural and then boxed in by suburban and then an urban and then ur you know that it kind of makes you wonder what was the scattershot planning well i don't know if it was scattershot planning as much as it was often a approved a, amendment to the comprehensive plan so, and I know that's a, it's a, comp, it's a pretty complex issue, but the day-to-day -day things that frustrate people in our county, very straightforward, are all things that come into play when they go to write this. So even if you don't know what their technical terms are, that doesn't matter. If you know <laughs> that they put this road in, in a place where it doesn't make sense and there's no road where it should have been and there's no light, those are the things that you can describe and you can say, it doesn't make sense to have done it this way. We live like this now, but going forward, this is how we should plan. And you know, let the people who understand the technical terms add a technical term to that. We need to hear about how the actual quality of life part of it affects, affects you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have one last question. Yes, mm -hmm. we've talked mm -hmm. about it. And uh, Michael, you yes. add that runoff from fertilizers can also contribute to the problem. Mm -hmm. yes. And then he also says, thank you for being a voice for those who desire responsible growth and protection for their quality of life. Thank you for being a voice for that. I mean, it was the, it was the voters. The voters talk loud and clear, you know, in our amendments, and with me, with, I, I mean, I think there there's a, a mandate and we will keep we will keep pushing, but I but I do want if you know, I I know I've said it a few times. I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but it it will take because I sometimes I am just one vote, so it will take engagement and constant engagement. And being here is awesome because then we can take notes and still think about these things. But also, it's important that if there is um, a board position that you think you could help with, jump in, or if you have some kind of expertise and you want to use it in a public comment, jump in. And I will um, be forever grateful because then it feels like we have a louder and more unified voice. And that's, that's how we'll get it done. I mean, I, I'm so grateful that we have a seat at the table being people that are concerned about these issues and that we finally um, have a sort of a you know, backstage view. But it doesn't mean that we can flip a switch and make it all right. It means that we now know where to start the hard work. So, um, so please stay in touch and engaged about those things and, um, and you know we have some pretty great technology that the um, that the office is using now to make sure that when we start a case that we are linking the people that it that we've heard from 
because I also think that when constituents don't know sometimes how many other people out there in the world or, or residents are having these issues, we can link them. We know, okay, you know what, this is an issue. This is something that we're hearing, and we really want to make sure that um, when we go to bat, we've got all of that factual basis, all the data, all mm -hmm. of the information, all of the how it's really affecting you day to day um, with us to try to, to make sure that we're getting the word to other decision makers. Because, you know, I can, can guarantee you we're going to work really hard on projects to improve all of these things that we've discussed this evening. But when it comes down to some of those votes, sometimes, you know, as just one vote, there <laughs> I will need there to be a overall dialogue in our community, which I feel like um, we're there. I feel like, you know, Orange County is informed enough to be able to do this and to talk to their own commissioners or to the mayor or to um, you know, anybody in, in government to make sure that we're getting that consensus. Yeah, I think the more people realize that by being active in their community, because I think that when a new commissioner is elected or when a new seat is filled in any political seat, people start to feel like, okay, I did my part, they're in, I can sit back and let them just go to work for me which is kind of true, yeah, I'm, yeah, but, sure, but the voices compiling right. together actually right. do something. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because, uh, I mean, the public pressure works. It works. It, it really works. And I think we have an engaged, educated, informed public. And, and I am so grateful for that. But I also think we have a lot of work to do and a lot of challenges. So yes, you're exactly right. The, the, you know, I can speak for a group of people, and if they're loud behind me, it makes my my work easier, more projected, and more laser focused. So yes, and I think you know we are willing and ready to do the heavy lifting on on that and the the research. But there are so many experts out there in their own fields that have an understanding about things that they don't realize would be helpful for us. So. Um, if it kind of crossed your mind that it might be helpful, it probably is. Reach mm -hmm. out. <laughs> we would love to. We'd love to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like part of your job is just being a community organizer and connecting people, and then being that voice from the inside. Yeah, it's representative democracy. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, and I'm very, um, very humbled by it. And I do think every day I wake up and I pinch myself because I love my job so much. Aww. So thank you for hiring me again. I know I've said it before, but I wake up every day and I'm like, I am. I'm so fortunate and so blessed to live here and to have this Aww. opportunity. Oh, that's so sweet. Do we have any other questions? So we have no other questions. The next meeting will be on December 30th, virtually. Um, I'm super grateful for everyone who did ask questions and please write to uh, district one, and that's the number one, district number one at ocfl.net if you want to make your voice heard so that we can start a case on your behalf and see it all the way into fruition and keep a record of it because just like the commissioner said when you compile all of those people that i know right now so many i got so many emails for chickens backyard chickens <laughs> i was like is this even coming up for a vote or I, why yeah. is it so many we gotta find out we're gonna find I out love it. Yeah. <laughs> any last words for people watching Oh, just thank you and be safe and enjoy your holiday season. I'm grateful for you. I know that we haven't been able to do big outdoor things or indoor things. And I just, I miss you all. I miss being in public places as much as we used to be, but it's going to happen. And, you know, keep an eye out for your neighbors. I think there's a lot of sadness this time of year on Goodyear because people miss the people they've lost this year in, in the year. And I think this year that's especially the case. So please try to keep an eye out for your neighbors, your friends, people that you know may be a little more alone this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, stay tuned. We are very grateful for you. And uh, and uh, happy New Year almost. Well, we're going to be on before New Year, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So happy holidays. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. And we will see you soon. Bye. Thank you all so much.